And I think that's when freedom really comes when you get that revelation because it is so liberating. And life takes on, for me, it took on a whole different way of enjoying, of appreciating, of being grateful and thankful for every moment of wherever it might be, whether I'm out in the, in the fresh air, in the garden, where I'm in the workshop, where I'm just sitting, chatting, whether I'm just looking at the birds out the window, whatever it might be, I, I have such rejoicing and celebration of it. So it's wonderful. So listening to, to people like usual, and um, there's so many people that have died and had near-death experiences, and um, and they're um, the one one person I was listening to was saying how that God had told them about because he asked for what his purpose was, and God said, "No, it's moment by moment. You you just." Uh, listening and 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 uh, to me, mm. and uh, so he mentioned that that wisdom is you know actually um, Solomon didn't ask for wisdom he he asked for um, a hearing heart, mm. and that wisdom actually is listening listening and I guess. Um, the intimacy with God is part of wisdom. So, so um, yesterday I was listening because uh, I'm always excited to listen to Justin Abraham, Abraham, and he was talking about cardiogenosis. Yeah, and that it, God gave him a twist on it that it's actually um, cardio. You're we're supposed to have cardio genosis into the divine so he used ephesians 117 that he would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him to make you intelligent and discerning in knowing him personally so yeah. it, it, actually that wisdom is knowing 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 god and the intimacy with god so is my question basically is like the spirit of wisdom is is supposed to is helping us to know God and yeah um yeah I mean when it comes to our understanding of wisdom you know, we tend to think of it that gives us insight into what to do in a particular situation yeah. where it's more what is the heart of the father in that situation so we're then motivated by the father's heart in a situation not with just oh i need to do this because the outworking of the father's heart can be done in many different ways it's not one way to do it there's multiple ways that multiple people would do it and they'll be all different but they'd all be according to the father's heart so the cardiogenosis is the heart to heart relationship in which the father is revealing his heart to us all the time in every situation um, that we face and in every dynamic that we face, we need to be an expression of the father's heart. So wisdom is that expression. You know, it's it's actually being us in that situation to outwork the father's heart, which is why there's not just one way of doing something. You know, and we do like mm -hmm. to formularize things and it's like, okay, here's the way to do it. But actually, God wants us to creatively outwork his heart because we are an expression of his manifoldness. Therefore, it would make sense that everyone would do it slightly differently. So it is the, the intimacy, the knowledge, which is experiential knowledge of the father and his heart <laughs> is what guides us, directs us and leads us into outworking his heart. And wisdom is the outworking of his heart, effectively. Um, so a lot of people want to know their scroll. They want to know their destiny. They know, want to know what they're supposed to do. Well, God is not going to tell you what you're supposed to do as much as reveal who you are. Because when he reveals who you are in relationship with him in intimacy, then He's going to reveal to you his heart and you outwork his heart through who you are. So your scroll is really a, a revelation of who you are, not a revelation of what you're supposed to do. 
And a lot of people are, are always fixed on because that's the workspace mentality most of us have been brought up with. What am I supposed to do? What's God's will? How can I do it? Well, God is not necessarily at work telling us his will in specifics, but revealing his heart. So Jesus only did what he saw the father doing. What he wasn't seeing was a vision of the father doing something. It was a revealing of the heart because he was in the father. The father was in him all the way along. So he had this cardiogenosis relationship of oneness and union and expressed that oneness and union every day of his life in relationship with the father. And he said, I am the father of one. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. And actually, that's how God wants us to be. If you've seen us, you've seen the Father. Because we're sons of God. And therefore, knowing the Father's heart frees us and gives us the liberty of expressing who we are to outwork the Father's heart. Rather than have a, a really rigid way of doing something. It's the heart of the Father that we express in every situation and of course that is going to be uh, an outworking of wisdom in that god has wisely made us to reflect him and his wisdom is outworked through us when we're expressing his heart um, and of course you know we will find that people will look at a situation through their redemptive gift through various aspects which causes them to engage a situation differently. So if I was to engage a situation and I know the father's heart for that situation, I'm going to engage that situation differently than someone who's a mercy gift or is a serving gift or a leader gift, because I will come at it at a completely different way through who God has made me to be, which ultimately is why we need more than one person to are at work the father's heart generally because each of us is coming from a particular perspective um, and therefore yeah there may be only us which is great um but we're still able to outwork the father's heart through who we are in that situation and i i think that frees us and gives us a lot of flexibility and to relax rather than feeling fearful of getting it right I've got to get it right or I, or I mustn't get it wrong or, you know, I need the perfect will of God in this situation, you know, and it, it binds people up into such tension that they don't do anything half the time because they're afraid of getting it wrong. You know, and God just wants us to be an expression of his heart towards people, which is an expression of love towards people. You know, and ultimately, when I engage with people, I'm engaging with God's heart of love towards those people and the oracles of his heart. He's passionate for those people. He's, he's, he has a burning desire for the best for those people. He has intense joy. Now, if I can express the father's heart towards people, they're going to feel how much God loves them, cares for them, wants them um, to in, in find the best for their lives in him, you know, without me being pressurized into trying to do something or even trying to do something the way Jesus would have done it or the way the father would have done it. The father, I'm not the father and I'm not Jesus. Therefore, I'm not going to do it the way they might have done it, but I will do it the way I'm made by him to outwork his heart. And that frees me and gives me a lot of liberty to enjoy life in all these things because i only have to be me you know my scroll is a is just me being me i am you know that is my scroll it isn't a list of instructions or things that i have to do in my life everything i do in my life can be an outworking of the father's heart and all of those things no matter whether there's a specific situation I can still be an expression of the father's heart to people in it. You know, and that, that is a lot of liberty and freedom and creativity to be the God, the person God made me to be. You know, 
if that makes sense. But it does require intimacy. Because to know the Father's heart, you can't do it at a distance. You can't be afraid of him. You can't, you've got a cardiogenosis is where there is this union that the Father's heart is revealed. Knowledge of the Father's heart is infused into us because we are close, because we are heart to heart. Yeah. And if people think, oh, God's up there somewhere and I'm down here somewhere and I've got to try and connect to God to find out what his heart is. No, God is in me. In the very core of my being. And I'm also in him. And therefore I can engage that with that level of intimacy, which is heart to heart, face to face, mind to mind, all of those, you know, deep things. So when it talks about being with God. That word in Greek is prost. It means face to face. There's that level of connection. You know, and that that's what life should be like, obviously. You know, so God intended it to be, but we're all learning to get there. And there'll be times when we forget and we default to certain behavioral patterns or learned patterns or things that we think we should do in a situation. You know, what should I do? You know. And sometimes it's actually nothing because the father doesn't have you to want you to do anything in that situation. That's the hardest thing to not do anything because you know, it's not the father's heart for you to do something in that situation. You know, and it's quite a lot of times I know I can do things, but I know that I don't have the okay from the father to do those things because other people need to do them you know but it's a very um i think freeing way of relating to god in that sense of intimacy which will bring that revelation of the father's heart uh, to us because it is it is a, a a degree of intimacy which can't be at a distance it can't be intellectual, you know, because what is it? The father, the eyes of our heart may be enlightened. So that deep inner knowing will have enlightenment, will be lit, illuminated, revealed within on our heart, not our head. Yeah. And that's why it's more instinctive rather than logical so like that word intimacy actually into me i see yeah. so basically um first corinthians 13 12 the message uh, no mirror says i i gaze face to face that i may know me mm. even as i have always been known so i thought that was kind of interesting <laughs> yeah, absolutely yeah and that's the father's heart that the vast sum of his thoughts about us that reveal um, the reality of who he made us to be are revealed to us in relationship, you know, and we then can agree with those wonderful thoughts about us. And when we don't agree, that's when we are transformed to be able to agree. Yeah. So it is wonderful. It's a wonderful way god has designed all of this to work and yet religion has created a whole lot of rules regulations and stuff around it that obscures the simplicity of relationship and intimacy mike it's always uh the battle of uh religion versus relationship mm. and I think to a certain extent that we all pre-program to seek God and that's that's why people endeavor to to seek God in their own way. Uh, now I have um, I am in touch with all these my school friends actually. And there are Hindus and there are Muslims and there are Christians and there are Jewish people. And everybody gets along and everybody has their own take on things. So for instance uh, I have a, a Hindu friend who's who's really knows his stuff, you know, mm. and he's hundred percent sure. He says that uh, 
Christianity has a lot of reference towards rebirth, to reincarnation. He says, mm -hmm. what is bo being born again? <laughs> you know, and he has this theory that Jesus came actually, where Jesus learned all his stuff is actually when he came to India through Kashmir. <laughs> and he spent a lot of, but I won't laugh at that because yeah. I actually entertained that thought for quite some time mm. in my sort of non-Christian days. Mm. And it, it, all these theories we entertain, we you know, because it's logic again, it's like religion is like we seek mm. logic to, to come to a certain conclusion. And then I had this, I had this encounter and all my theories I actually had to flush down the toilet because once you experience Jesus and that 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 love emanating from him and that unconditional love that is pouring out of him, all theories are redundant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I is people come up with all sorts of ideas of Jesus to make him into a prophet or a good man or or a, a guru or whatever. Um and the reality is Jesus is an expression of the Father, the perfect expression of the Father. He and the Father are one, you know, and that that is really the relationship we engage in so that we can know that we're also one with him. And he's in us and we're in him. And you have this amazing intimate relationship of being in I am, you know, therefore I am in I am because I begin to find revelation of who I am within I am which is exactly what Jesus was talking about in John 14. You know, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to prepare you to be this dwelling place. And that where I am, you may be also. You know, where was he? In the father. And the father was him. And then in, I think it's verse 19, it says, on that day, you're going to know. You're going to know. They didn't know up to that point. They only heard what he said. None of them have experienced that Jesus was in them and they were in him and they were all in the father. None of them had experienced that at that moment until on the day of resurrection, he appears in the upper room and he breathes on them and he says, receive the spirit. And then they knew on that day, you will know that I'm in you and you're in me. Yeah, you will know. Yeah, not, you know, I'm going to tell you about it and you'll read books about it and you'll discover intellectual knowledge about it. No, you will know on that day. And they did. And therefore the whole of mankind was rebirthed on that day. The whole of mankind were indwelt by the Holy Spirit on that day. And that revelation is what, the father sought to occur the spirit of truth would reveal that all of those people were now included in jesus and that jesus the holy spirit that were included in them looking to reveal themselves so that they could experience that you know just as paul decreed on the, the damascus road you know as he expressed what happened to him Father was pleased to reveal his son in me. Because Paul encountered on the Damascus Road what had happened on the day of resurrection. And yet all of that time he had been resisting by following his own religious rules and own mind. So he had been resisting what God was trying to do in revealing himself in Paul. And he was kicking against it, fighting for his own religious rights to do it his way. And all of a sudden, it was like, well, who are you, Lord? You know, well, I'm Jesus. And it's just like, bang, boom. And every one of his other past life experiences of religion and being a Pharisee and being a, a Jew and being this, that and the other were like, as his you know, the polite version of his expression was they were dung. You know, nothing amounted to anything when he had that revelation that Jesus was in him. And he was in Jesus, included in what Jesus had done. You know, and he'd been resisting it all his life. 
basically. You know, and ultimately the revelation came through the experience of engaging with the truth the light the revelation of that and experiencing that jesus was at work in him and as soon as he surrendered to the work in him everything changed everything you know and and that's unfortunately where a lot of people are today god is exactly the same looking to reveal himself in people unveil his, his love and they are either ignoring doing it their own way feeling guilty or condemned or not good enough for god or trying to do earn god's favor through religious effort and work and works whether they're hindus or muslims or anything else there's something you have to do you know um, and they're caught up in that doing which is just a work which wears them out basically end of the day people end up weary now obviously those who were following the old covenant religion and were trying to follow the law were extremely weary and tired trying to perform it and be good enough because they could never be good enough through their own efforts which was why the revelation was so amazing hey you don't have to be good enough i've made you righteous you are now the righteousness of god in christ how did that happen because that is what jesus did through the finished work of the cross and his grace and mercy and love he made us righteous therefore we have the ability to enter into the presence of god but we're kept from it by our own minds we're alienated from the promises and the truth by our own thinking whether that is oh i'm i'm guilty i'm can i'm not good enough god could never you know, have me in his presence you know or yeah i need to i need to do this or that offer this or do this or perform this or whatever it might be you know and that keeps us from the very thing which actually is already operating in us you know so, yeah it is um it is sad that so many people are trapped in their own mind or their own version of god or gods which they have generated or followed because of that alienation from the truth of who jesus is in them already you know mike even today it's lost in translation because that um sentence uh, paul preached to the gentiles instead of jesus in the gentiles yeah that's right huh? wrong wrong translation yeah but his message and paul's message of inclusion was preach christ in the gentiles not among them or to them but in them so he was preaching the message that he just experienced you know and he, there is no prayer of repentance in there there is no you know oh acknowledging the four spiritual laws or anything else there was just wow you know that's paul's response was just wow you know um you know no, no nothing more than that and and in engaging that you know and it was like wow you know but we've come up with all sorts of ways of doing it trying to do it you know following some methodology for it you know and you go back in history you don't see that you don't see that in the wits whitfield and wesley revivals and stuff you just see them encountering god you find them doing exactly what paul did wow whether they're in tears or laughter or whatever it might be they experience the power and presence of god revealed in them at that moment and they engaged it they never prayed a prayer they never did an altar call they never did any of the things that we've invented so that people can be saved they just realized that they were already saved and forgiven and loved and they wept because of it with joy you know i think so many people think oh they were so convicted of their sin that they were weeping with fear no they were weeping with joy when the revelation that they had already been forgiven and included 
and that God was already at work in them to reveal himself and to reveal them, you know, which is just amazing good news. And we've just found so many ways to make it bad news. You know, how do we get so far from the very simple message that was shared <laughs> and experienced? In, but probably, you know, generally in the last few hundred years, we've come up with all these ways of making people get saved because they have to jump through some hoop or other, whether it's being baptized or whether it's taking the sacraments or whether it's confession and repentance or whatever it might be. We've come up with a lot of solutions so that they can be saved when God just wants them to know they already are. And salvation is such an amazing experience of freedom. You know, I watched that. I watched the movie last night, The Jesus Revolution, um, which was a sort of sanitized version of the Lonnie Frisbee and <laughs> Greg Laurie uh, sort of story. Um, but great. I, I enjoyed it. But, you know, but what came over was the pure joy of acceptance and, and being loved. You know, that they just knew that they were loved. And it was a wonderful explosion of love that took place all over. You know, that spread like wildfire because there was acceptance and there was love. Yeah. Uh, and it was the perfect message for the day. Yeah. And it's still the perfect message for our day, you know. I think that experience is, uh, is actually just the start because then you have to start the process of deconstruction of all the crap that you've learned over the years. <laughs> and if... <laughs> well, yes. I mean, I think for Paul, it seemed to be quite a quick experience in that he shut himself away for a while, went into the desert, uh, where had encounters with God in heaven, and there seemed to be a major deprogramming and reprogramming to realize what the truth was of this amazing message of inclusion. Um, yeah, for us, you know, Paul had all the Old Testament religion to realize uh, this is just dung. You know, and I don't think it took him long to come to that conclusion. Um, now, whether there was a lot of individual things that were then tinkered around with or whatever i don't know um, but for us there does seem to be a process of renewing our minds by revealing the things which we have believed which aren't true you know and deconstructing those things and the longer we've been in it obviously probably the more deconstruction needs to take place it would be great if it was just a complete wipe and reprogramming but actually that wouldn't be relational you wouldn't have gone through the experience of learning how good god is of how much God loves you and how you how that love is worked out in practice in our lives, you know, because of his wonderful grace and mercy towards us. You know, we've ex we experience it, you know, and those experiences are what brings about the testimony that is how we we live in. You know, if we just had knowledge, it would just be intellectual. You know, and God wants us to experience it, which is why I think it takes the time. You know, and for some, it's harder than others, generally, because they find it hard to let go. Or they want the logical ex explanation of why. You know, and they need the why. You know, I was like that. You know, I needed to know why. You know, but then I got to find God's love intoxicating to a point where well i don't need to know why anymore i trust you so whether you want to explain to me or not that's up to you but i don't need it anymore because i trust in the amazing love that you have for me and the amazing grace and mercy that you have to express towards me and therefore i stop needing all of the explanation and the intellectual aspect of it, it doesn't mean that i don't understand stuff but a lot of stuff I understand is by that cardiogenosis heart to heart rather than a whole lot of teaching 
from God about things. You know. Mike, the question yeah. is that I guess that with the church today, mm. which is really the, the messenger mm. of the good news. Mm, yeah, should be. Kind of, that's how it is throughout the world. Uh, that's the belief system. Yeah. Or, and I'm, I'm thinking of the church, the people who make up the church. Yeah. The believers. Because mm. we're, the, we're the message. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the, the, that because of the belief system, it just kind of somewhat, I, I know if you, I don't know about anyone else's experience, if you talk to someone that, old friends that you knew from 10 or 15 years ago that fervently loved Jesus, fervently believe they know who they are and who Jesus is. Um, and you mentioned this, you're a heretic. Mm. Um, and the fact is the messengers, I'm, I'm just thinking like, how does this ever get out there? Because it, it's such a simple message. Uh -huh. He's already in a strong where he's safe. And they go, what? Yep. And they, they can quote you some scriptures or whatever, but it's it's such a a mindset that we've got. And it's been going on for centuries. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And sadly, a lot of it has come down to you know, what we believe in determines what God does. That That's what their view is. You know, I was looking at a, a verse yesterday in, in Romans. I think it was Romans 3. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's a classic sort of evangelical mantra. You know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's like, yeah, we're all sinners. You know, and and it's like, yeah, but look around it. Look at the... It's the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe there is no distinction because it was talking about Jews and Gentiles. But they quote then, ah, yeah, but it's only for those who believe. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say when you believe. It says. If you believe or all that believe, because the belief is coming to the knowledge of what's already happened. Not. When you believe, God will make you righteous. Because obviously after that verse, we're justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. So the redemption is already in Christ Jesus. We've already been redeemed in Christ Jesus. As soon as we believe that, we enter into it. We experience it because it's already happened. So the belief doesn't make it happen. And that's that's the twist on the evangelical gospel. Your belief makes something happen rather than when you believe what's already happened, you will experience it. So in that passage, you know, and I was listening to someone talk about it and it was like, yeah, they focus on, OK, all. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah. But then. Being justified as a gift. That's the same all. It doesn't, it doesn't say, oh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then some are justified as a gift. It's the same all who have sinned and fall short of the glory are justified as a gift. Yeah, it's already done. You know, and you look at look at that, those things, and there's always been a twist to, ah, yes, but it's only for those who believe. No, it's only those who believe actually experience it. But the reality is true for everyone because it's the all. You know, and as soon as you've got an all in there and there are so many alls when you look at in the particularly when Paul was talking about lots of alls, you know, all died in Adam, all were made alive in Christ. You know, he it's a, it just the all is the all on both parts of the equation. And the same thing here. Yes, all have sinned, all have lost their way or lost their identity and have fallen short of who God made them to be effectively, not miss this mark where you have to attain a standard, but you've lost your identity and therefore you're not actually expressing the glory that God made you in. All 
is included there and then all is suddenly not there when those are being justified by a gift through the redemption which is in christ jesus because but there's there's no verses in that letter there's no separation from that it's the same all and actually that righteousness will become available to all of them by acknowledging the fact that it's all you know and that that's the difference between the good news and the bad news you know because it's certainly not good news to say well you've got to do this or you're not acceptable or you've got to do this or you're not included and you will become included if you do this you know and people are just programmed because I, I you know if i was to talk at someone who's an evangelical about that verse and i were to say but it is the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ for all those who believe they would say when they believe that's the problem so the same all for those who believe is the same all who have fallen short or lost their identity and it's the same all who are therefore made righteous by a gift you know there's no difference there there's no distinction obviously between jew and gentile so it's nothing to do with the law which is what the passage was talking about and then it's all everyone's included in this this is really good news most people don't believe it yet and that is why they're not experiencing it not because they need to believe it so it happens for them in a sense because we've made it when you believe not believing you know that and that's that's part of the problem you know so when you believe god will forgive you god will make you born again god will come and dwell within you when you believe rather than no it's already happened and when you believe it you enter into the experience of it you know totally different gospel you know and it's not you know when paul said i'm not ashamed of the gospel it's the power of god unto salvation absolutely that good news is the power of god because god has already saved everybody because it's already been made righteous in christ you know but everything comes gets twisted you know and I did the same thing for years in evangelical things. It was when, when you believe or when you repent or when you confess, then God will. Rather than, no, when you believe what he's already done, it will become your experience. Now, that is good news because it takes all the pressure off what we have to do. And, and I guess the follow up to that, Mike, is. And guess what? If you can't believe he's done that, it doesn't really matter because he has done it in you and it's a reality. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And that means that when we are faithless, he is faithful. You know, we're not saved by our faith. And this is another evangelical mantra. We're saved by faith. We're not. We're saved by grace through faith. And that is not ours because it's a gift because we can't boast and for those who say well i don't have enough faith so well god has given you all the faith you need it's a gift you don't have to come up with i gotta believe this because when you experience it you will believe it and and does it really faith mean there faith mean when as you said experience or hear him or however how he communicates hmm. that experience to me but it's is communicating which it becomes the faith yeah oh absolutely yeah it's it's not something we do or have to have and that is unfortunately how it's been presented that we have to have faith in order for god to do something whereas actually no we don't he's already done it so when he says being an old kenneth hagen disciple not moving faith what he's really saying there is when you have enough experience of who you are in me and who I am in you, you can move mountains. That's what faith is. Oh, absolutely. Because you'll know who you are, what work in your heart in me. Yeah, totally. Yeah. 
And all of that is, you know, where, and it again talks about in Galatians where it talks about, you know, I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Not I live by my faith in the son of God, which is how it's been translated wrongly because they view it that thing. It's my faith. I'm saved by my faith. And if I don't have enough faith, well, you need a mustard seed, but you still need your faith, even if it is a mustard seed. And and people struggle. Well, I uh, well, I you know, I can't. You know, why did why did Paul believe on the Damascus Road? Because he experienced the blinding light of God that came round him and God spoke to him and revealed Jesus in him. You know, it was like all God's work. None of it was Paul's. Yeah. All he had to do was like, oh, yeah. You know, well, how could he not believe that? Having experienced that revelation. And, uh, you know, when I watched the, the movie, you know, this, you know, Jesus revolution thing, it was the encounters they had with God's love, which unveiled the truth. Now, it was dressed up in all the religious stuff of Calvary Chapel and all that stuff. But actually, it wasn't what they were saying that made any difference. It was what the experience they had when they encountered God, whether they encountered him when they were baptized or whatever, when it was, something changed their being able to ex believe. Because all of a sudden, well, now I do believe. You know, I've experienced that. It didn't faith as in blind faith. You're never going to experience this. So you just have to believe and have no experience. That, unfortunately, is what it became. You know, it's not about your experience. It's about your faith. You know, and even when you don't experience it, have faith. Well, I don't want a life with no experience. That's like saying you want a marriage with no sex. You, know, like you, you don't want you want the whole package. You want the whole experience of life in god because he has it all for you you know and to say well just believe it you know there's so so many people struggle you know well you just got to believe by faith as if and and even encountering heaven and all the stuff that we do when we're talking about ascensions and all that well just do it by faith in other words just try and do it well, it doesn't work trying to do it like that. Do it by faith. That, and ultimately, we don't do it by my faith. We enter into the promise. The promise is come up here. The promise is enter in through the door. The pro we enter in through the promise which he's made. But it's not my faith in that promise that makes it work. It's the power within the promise. When I come into agreement with, it opens the door. You know, so we've sort of created a whole lot of stuff based on, you know, what our faith is. You know, have faith in God that you've never met. Well, they all met Jesus. Well, they didn't need to have faith in Jesus, did they? They met him, they knew him, they experienced him, and they believed in him. And when we come to experience him, we will believe in him. And when other people come to experience him, they will believe in him. But we've told them, it doesn't matter about the experience, you just got to believe in him, even though you've never met him, and you have no evidence for the fact, but just believe. So we've created a whole different gospel and generated a whole different view of what faith is and you're absolutely right as soon as you have that experience that is outworked in your life you know faith is really what he gives us the ability to believe in the reality of what we've had experienced you know, it's a, it's a product of the experience not something that generates the experience so, Mike, when you're out working, being a, a real novice <laughs> uh, or a baby, you're just going up there and just sitting with him and just discussing your heart with him. Yeah. 
and just sitting with him and just waiting. Yeah. Not necessarily anything happens or whatever. It's just all you're doing. Well, that's that's where you can abide and dwell. Whether you do it consciously, whether you're doing it, it's ha- it's all the time. We are seated with him in heavenly places. It's yeah. all the time. It's happening. We just become more aware of it and we become beneficial of it. But it's happening all the time. So, you know, I used to want to know what was going on and what 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 was what do you want me to do? And, you know, I want what's my mandate and what am I supposed to be doing and all this stuff, you know, and because I was still driven by a, an old covenant mindset of works and obedience and duty and obligation and all that stuff. And I just relaxed as I realized how much I'm unconditionally loved, I relaxed and I just dwell in the, his presence, in the light of his face, in the heart to heart intimacy. I dwell there. So there's this constant flow of truth, revelation, experience, intimacy, whatever, all the different names for it that's flowing all the time. Now, sometimes, yes, I consciously turn into that and i engage it consciously because it's great because it's great to be in that intimate place of being surrounded by love and light and truth and love and it's amazing and and it's good to experience that cognitively at times as long as we don't make the cognitive experience our goal because we have to Uh, we have to know by cognitive experience otherwise we won't believe i do have cognitive experiences at times but most of the dwelling abiding in his presence is in the spirit not in the soul or the flesh it's in the spirit so my spirit is constantly dwelling and abiding in god's presence and that wonderful place of abiding is what brings the peace and the joy and the love into my life flowing all the time which what reveals the father's heart going back to our the first question it was all about well how do you have this wisdom to know what the father's heart is it gets infused when you dwell and abide there he constantly reveals his heart to you and you just instinctively flow from his heart rather than what i used to do i want to go and get my mandate for today you know and it was like and yeah did god give me the yeah he did because he's gracious and he's merciful because i was still a child if you like and i still didn't know him that well so i still wanted to know what he wanted me to do now i dwell in his presence and i live my life in a way that is living in love and joy and peace and being at rest And at working every day in every situation, that amazing love that he has, you know, and therefore in any situation, do I have to sort of go and do this SOS prayer to God? Oh, God, help me. I need to know what I'm supposed to do here. No, I instinctively know what to do. And the more intimate I am, the easier that flow is to just be. I just need to be me in a situation. Whereas before I needed to know what to do in a situation. You know, and that is such a different place. Now I feel I'm at rest. Before I thought I was at rest. But actually I was still needing to do. Now I just need to be. And everything flows out of that being. And most of it actually it's just me being me you know i don't i don't need to have a whole oh i gotta do this i gotta do this this. and someone says okay someone says oh will you pray for me oh god do i have permission to pray for this person it's like no i just need to be me and if i feel how to pray for that person or engage that person then i just have to express that You know, I don't need, oh, how should I pray? What should I do? I I need to pray in tongues for five minutes to tune in. (laughs) All of it was like this work that we, and part of that was, well, I didn't want to get it wrong and I want to get it right. 
now I just need to be instinctively me in that situation. And I find that sometimes I say things or I do things or I hug someone or whatever it might be instinctively without having that, oh, I got to know what I'm supposed to do here. Because I know if I'm me, I'm going to be expressing the father's heart, the me he made me to be, not the me, me that I might have been or might want other people want me to be or anything else. The he that he made me to be, which is coming from the revelation of the father's heart that I'm experiencing in that intimacy of dwelling there and abiding there. It is so much easier than I ever thought. Yeah. And all the other stuff that I used to do and I am still doing in a in the spirit, you know, in a multidimensional way. I'm still just expressing me in it. You know, I don't need that great list of instructions anymore. I just don't need it. You know, and life takes on such a joyful position because I enjoy being I'm being joy being alive. You know, I enjoy being in the garden. I enjoy being in the workshop. I enjoy being. Mm. So much more fun. You know, it's so much more joyful than I could have ever imagined or thought going through this process. So cardio, cardionosis is actually infusing your, uh, your, your whole being through your spirit being yeah. uh also so that is goodness is constantly with you mm -hmm. and you don't need to actually bother about cognitive uh what's he saying at this moment it's always goodness and and, and it's an infusion and so your whole being is flooded with his with his presence and you're always actually in his heart and uh, vice versa yeah absolutely that's exactly what it is it's so much easier than I ever imagined or thought. But it does require the intimacy of dwelling in that place. And sometimes it takes time to get to that place because of all the other stuff, the mindsets and belief systems, the way we feel about ourselves and the fact that you know we've been conditioned by a whole load of conditioning through culture and through religion, which hinders me just being because it's all doing. That's the problem. My culture and my religious upbringing was all about what I had to do. None of it equipped me to be. It just wore me out doing. But God had a plan. He took me through the doing so I could become who I am. So I, to be, you know, I am that I am. It's, it's the sort of state of being and conscious awareness of just being me. Yeah. And he, yes, he took me through all the things of learning and then realizing that that was who I always was anyway. You know, but that's me. Someone may not need to do all that. You know, I, I, I'm me and I have a particular purpose in some things of like helping other people. So being able to explain something is helpful to some people yeah you know, but for others you know who aren't me you may never need to know all the stuff i know or all the stuff other people know all you need to know is what you need to know and most of that is actually who you are not how to do it all you know and a lot of what we do is help people to understand how to do it and then when they get close to God, they'll realize, oh, I'm doing all that anyway, because that's who I am. Yeah. Now, when I had the revelation of multidimensional living, God showed me. You know, he, he spoke to me and he said, I'm taking the blinkers off your eyes because you've only had glimpses of who you are. So I thought, oh, OK. And then he then revealed 
each multi-dimensional non-linear perspective that I am. And I realized, wow, I never realized I had such a capacity in who I am. I never realized that I could be in multiple places doing multiple things synchron synchronously, simultaneously. I didn't realize, but I was doing it without realizing it because if i did realize it i wouldn't have thought i could have done it i would have tried to figure out how i could possibly do it so god was very wise in that he didn't show me while i was doing all these things and actually just being until i was able to be able to take on that on board and it didn't freak me out and i just rejoiced in it it's like wow i'm this is who I am, you know? And yeah, there was a whole lot of stuff that was flowing out of who I am. But I don't have to consciously go and try and do all that every day. If I did, I would be totally burnt out. Completely, if I tried to do everything that I am in a workspace mentality, I would be completely burnt out. Yeah. You know? And God was... He, I got a glimpse along the way until he took the blinkers off and said, now you're ready to see. And I'm like, whoa, this is beyond what I could have imagined or possibly thought. Now I can just say, wow, awesome. You know, and I just carry on being. You know, and I think that's the key for all of us. That is what rest is. We rest from doing so that we can just be and everything just flows out of our being uh, in mostly a non-conscious way because god wants us to be conscious here and enjoy life here and people spend too much time trying to do all the heavenly stuff and they don't enjoy life here life therefore for them life is oh this is getting in the way of me doing stuff and God wants you to enjoy the things that you think are getting in the way because you're already doing them. And I think that's when freedom really comes, when you get that revelation. Because it is so liberating. And life takes on, for me, it took on a whole different way of enjoying, of appreciating, of being grateful and thankful for every moment of wherever it might be whether I'm out in the, in the fresh air, in the garden, where I'm in the workshop, where I'm just sitting, chatting, whether I'm just looking at the birds out the window, whatever it might be, I I have such rejoicing and celebration of it. It's so, so wonderful. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, right, okay. I'm going to leave it there. So... Nice catching up with you for the first time again this year. And uh, let's look for a, a good year, <laughs> a better year, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> for some things. Uh, but I'm sure God's good. And I'm sure God's desire is to bless us abundantly so that we can be a blessing to others in that way by helping them to enjoy life as well. You know, and not put them into any bondage that we couldn't fulfill ourselves you know it's just like when paul was talking to them about the law and well you couldn't fulfill it i couldn't fulfill it you know we're all under bondage to it and you know and then he was like no i'm going to bring you freedom from all that but when we've just created our evangelical version of the law yeah. which puts people under the same bondage which they can't fulfill or do yeah, so let's bring people into the freedom of the amazing unconditional love of God and, and help them to experience it. Thank you for watching our YouTube channel. We really appreciate you taking the time. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.